I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to welcome all our nominees to the committee today. And um, the, you're under consideration for senior positions in Department of Commerce and Department of Transportation, as well as the renom renomination of the current acting commissioner, acting chairman, I should say, of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, DOT, of course, plays a key role in the infrastructure of the nation. It's important that its senior leadership be in place to work with Congress and their uh, and the array of stakeholders as we seek to improve safety and maintain and expand the nation's transportation networks. These transportation networks fundamentally underpin the nation's economy, so it's important that those who directly oversee these networks have the experience and skills necessary to manage this critical enterprise. Uh, I'll be asking Mr. Mendez, Mr. Rogoff about their perspectives on some of the challenges facing the Highway Trust Fund, as well as their um, broader views on the state of the nation's transportation networks. These nominees already have track records of valuable service at DOT, and I suspect there will be considerable support for their nominations. The Department of Commerce plays an important role on a diverse range of issues, from managing satellite programs within the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to managing the federal government's radio spectrum holdings. Senior leaders at the Department of Commerce must manage a wide range of challenging programs. If confirmed, uh, Mr. Andrews and Mr. Jadot will have no shortage of issues and, and problems to tackle. I'm guessing that Mr. Andrews may have observed many nominees from this side of the dais and thought to himself, I can do that, I think. <laughs> or maybe he was just thinking that while he was looking at us, Mr. Chairman, but uh, either way he's going to have his chance. Um, I'll be asking Mr. Andrews about his views on how best to manage the risk facing the Department of Commerce, particularly with respect to its satellite programs. I'm also interested in Mr. Andrews' views on the progress of the FirstNet program, the nationwide public safety network that will be funded by the proceeds from the broad broadcast spectrum auction currently planned for next year. Finally, Mr. Chairman, the Consumer Product Safety Commission plays a leading role in overseeing the safety of a wide variety of consumer products. This is important work, and I'm looking forward to hearing how the Commission is faring and meeting its mission and obligations. As I've stated previously, the CPSC is a creature of Congress created in 1972 by the Consumer Product Safety Act, and as such, its authority is very carefully bounded by the law. Uh, I am aware that some have characterized the Commission as being too unaccountable and, and overreaching as a regulator that does not always abide by the boundaries prescribed by Congress. Now, I'll look forward to asking Mr. Adler, who has served as the acting chairman of the CSPC over the past eight months, about issues such as third-party testing where Congress mandated that the CPSC pursue opportunities to reduce testing burdens, but where the Commission has thus far failed to adopt any meaningful reforms. Another issue surrounds the Buckyballs case, where many legal experts observed an apparent overreach of federal regulatory power when the CPSC sought to pierce the so-called corporate veil of a lawful corporation selling a legal product, a step that's traditionally reserved for cases of fraud or criminal conduct. All of us support the CPSC's mission of ensuring consumer safety, but I'm hoping that Mr. Adler will be able to address my misgivings about what appears to be a regulatory agency that has ignored some of its congressional moorings. Mr. Chairman, before we turn to the, the nominees for their uh, prepared remarks, I also would like to underscore the importance of two pressing issues that relate to matters that this committee is closely involved with, the one being the Highway Trust Fund, which is uh, going to be depleted uh, here uh, next month or the month after. And uh, as we look toward a long-term solution, I hope we can come up with a, uh, a short-term uh, solution that at least addresses the, uh, the immediate uh, crisis in front of us, recognizing how important it is that, uh, that we fund our highway and transportation infrastructure in this country. And then secondly is the Internet tax moratorium, which is set to expire on November the 1st. And this committee has had a role in establishing that. If you go back to 1998, um, we have to act before the August recess on that as well, because if we don't, there will be tens of millions of Americans who are receiving notifications from their Internet and wireless phone providers about new taxes that would kick in just before the holiday season. So I, I raise this topic because the tax moratorium has been very instrumental when it comes to ensuring that broadband infrastructure investments are made, which is a win-win, uh, not just for consumers, but for our economy. And um, uh, those of us who serve on the Finance Committee are also very interested in this issue, and I've worked with uh, the chairman there, Senator Wyden, on a permanent extension of the Internet tax moratorium, 
and have appreciated the work of Senator Ayotte on this legislation, on this committee, and note that uh, we have all of our members on this side as co-sponsors. A number of Democrat colleagues are co-sponsors, and I hope that we can, uh, in addition to getting the highway trust fund gap dealt with, also pass uh, this bipartisan legislation before August so that we ensure that American consumers and businesses aren't faced with new charges and unnecessary taxes on their phone and cable bills come November of this year. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate uh, having all these noms before us today and look forward to uh, their testimony, and thank you for holding the hearing. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me, if uh, I'd like to, Mr. Andrews, just to ask you about the NTIA's proposed transition of the IANA functions to the multi-stakeholder community, and I think that's a uh, something that your department has testified uh, about before the House of Representatives. And I'm wondering if you could discuss specifically what some of the valid concerns are that have been raised regarding the proposed uh, transition, and if confirmed, uh, if any, what role you would have in overseeing that transition. Sure. Um, so, Senator, you raise um, an issue that we see as very important. And I think starting from the premise of what are we trying to do here. And I think we all agree on the importance of protecting a secure, keeping the internet open and secure is an engine for growth and innovation. I think we also share the same concern about internet governance and the multi-stakeholder process being very important. Um, the third concern I think we all share is keeping the internet, there are a number of authoritarian governments that would like to change the internet governance model. And so one of the reasons we have sought the, the privatization to, of the IANA function was first proposed actually in 1998. And it's been the policy of the United States government over the course of time to have a multi-stakeholder run process. So if confirmed, I will uh, definitely be involved in this and definitely want to make sure that certain protections are met in order that if we do go through with this transition and as we move it forward, uh, that we keep the open and secure nature of the internet, that we protect the domain name system um, we make sure that stakeholders are protected. And I think one of the things that's important to note in this, when NTIA made this proposal, groups as diverse as the Chamber of Commerce and the internet users, the companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, all came out and supported this because I think they recognize this is important to be able to protect the multi-stakeholder model, and particularly from the countries that would like to gain greater control or move control of internet governance to intergovernmental agencies like the UN or the ITU. And so it's important for we as a country to make sure the misimpression that is out there that the US controls the internet is not the case. So I, we take the concerns of Congress very seriously, and we will continue to keep those in mind as we move this discussion forward. And I think the main concern is that there's some, some structure that would lead to an outcome that would not entail the UN or the ITU or some um, government that would want to co-op this thing. And uh, there, there's, so there's, a, there's, it's kind of a, it's very, um, I guess I would say, sort of murky out there in terms of what, how this might end. And I think that's the, the concern that's been raised. And so I hope that uh, you'll stay in close contact with us as, as that process moves forward. And, and um, I think there's even been some attempts on the House side to prevent that from moving forward. So there, you, you, can, you, you understand and realize there are some very valid concerns out there. Um, let me uh, follow up on with Mr. Mendez and Mr. Rogoff something that uh, the chairman talked about, and that is the highway, highway bill reauthorization. Um, there's some, I think, resistance on both sides uh, to uh, the mechanism that's been proposed by the administration for funding. Uh, there are other ideas that are out there. What we end up doing in the near term, probably, regrettably, will be a piecemeal cobble together some a few um, things that will help pay for a short-term extension, but it doesn't solve the long-term problem. Uh, I've asked this uh, question uh, of your boss in the past about what other types of things that you might support in terms of um, financing mechanisms to reauthorize the Highway Trust Fund, and so I would pose that question of you as well. Um, what you, you told us we need to fix it. Um, how willing is the administration to engage in, uh, in, in getting out behind uh, uh, the types of um, solutions that it would take to get that done? I'll start off. Uh, sir, 
Secretary Fox, in a, a number of his uh, public statements, has made very clear that while the administration stands firmly behind our proposal, uh, and we've identified um, three potential offsets as part of pro-growth business tax reform to make it happen, that we are opening, open to discussing and hearing and conversing on alternatives that Congress may want to put forward. Uh, I believe it was just yesterday that he made clear that nothing is off the table. Uh, and that is our position going forward. We stand behind our proposal, but uh, our ears are open. Okay. Well, that uh, isn't exactly what I was hoping to hear. I, it, it'd be nice to have the administration weigh in, uh, too. I mean, I understand the idea of working with the Congress. We certainly welcome that. My experience around here is that in order for big things to happen, you've got to have not only um, the legislative branch, where you've got 435 House members and 100 senators who all have different ideas about how to resolve these things are on the finance committee, 21 or 22 of us, uh, that presidential leadership is really essential to do big things. And um, so I know you've got the, the, the one proposal out there. Uh, we appreciate your at least leading forward with that. But like I said, I, my impression is from some of the discussions that we've had that there are, there's resistance to that, objections uh, that are not just uh, confined to the Republican side of the aisle. And um, so to the degree that uh, the administration would like to engage further and weigh in behind specific proposals, I think we would certainly welcome and appreciate uh, that kind of leadership. Um, I've got a question, Mr. Chairman, I can submit for the record uh, for Mr. Adler. And Go ahead. Those, well, I don't want to get other people that want to ask questions. But um, let me just uh, quickly, if I might, um, Mr. Adler, we all want to make our products on the market safe. Uh, want to ensure that we do that in the um, in a way that doesn't impose an undue regulatory burden on you know businesses that are trying to recover in this economy. When Congress passed uh, Public Law 112/28, we were especially concerned about the significant cost of third-party testing, and Congress therefore directed the agency to look for and to implement ways to reduce those costs and to report back to Congress if it needed additional authorities, and. I'm concerned the agency's efforts to date have been minimal in that regard and, uh, and treated as a lower priority, I think, as was evidenced by the vote last month not to devote additional staff resource to that effort, even when those resources were apparently available. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, understanding that the agency staff and outside stakeholders have identified opportunities to reduce those testing burdens, but none of those have been implemented. Um, how do you see this uh, playing out? Um, do you hold the view that the agency shouldn't act to reduce some of those burdens? Uh, Senator, thank you so much for the question, and also thank you for signaling that you were going to ask me the question. It allowed me to think through the answer, and I also want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to sit down with your staff. Um, and you're quite correct in describing what happened in 112.28. 112.28 didn't just direct us to do burden reduction. That would have been a much simpler mandate. It said burden reduction with respect to third-party testing consistent with assuring compliance with existing CPSC rules and regulations. And that's a very challenging task ahead for the Commission. I honestly believe we've dedicated the necessary resources. It's not an easy matter to come up with ways to reduce third-party testing, which have lots and lots of fixed costs. We've had a lot of dialogue with our stakeholders, our industry stakeholders, especially small business, and they have expressed consistently the desire that we expand on one particular approach to addressing uh, the burdens, and that is through a process that we call determinations. And the delight of a determination is if you can make a determination that a product or a product component will never flunk any of the CPSC rules and regulations, you can exempt them completely from third-party testing. We did that back in August of 2009, and we had a forum this past April, April 3rd, in which we had a lot of industry stakeholders present uh, arguments and data in support of our expanding our determinations. And I'd love to say that it was an easy scientific judgment. In point of fact, one of the most exciting suggestions that was made was to address phthalates in consumer products, children's products, by looking to see which were the most rigid products because phthalates are plasticizers. So we took that suggestion, our staff tested it, and unfortunately, the suggestion that was made to us turned out not to exclude phthalates. 
So it's a very, very challenging scientific inquiry, but I just want to assure you that I view it as extremely important, uh, that we're working on it as hard as we can. In fact, I put in an amendment during the discussion that you referenced to add as a project addressing whether untreated wood has heavy metals that are banned in uh, ASTM F963. So let me just assure you that it is a project that I think is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.